So Rabamari. That He's is our name. guest. <laughs> <laughs> that is the name of the person that we're interviewing today. So uh, he was with the New York Post. He was with the Wall Street Journal. He writes a bunch of hot takes. And now he has a new publication called Compact. Yeah, it's a populist view on class and economy. And uh, it's kind of hard. I guess it's hard for me to describe as not a smart person. But it yes, talks about political. He will describe it for us. And it sounds like a very compelling it's magazine that you guys should check out. Cool. We talked about everything from Catholicism and Protestantism to class. And as conservatives, do we need to worry about class? Or is that all Karl Marx? And we even touched on his uh, famous debate with David French over... Frenchism and drag queen story hours. This episode has drag queens. This episode has saints that you pray to. This episode has fat people on the covers of magazines. You're it's got everything. <laughs> Sorab Amari. Well, Saurabh, how did you find yourself in this, you know, in this crazy world of commenting on news and uh, and being a thinker? And it must be hard for you, you know. You're you're a guy who tries to think deeply about things, and uh, everything is so stupid. There was a question in there somewhere. Go ahead, talk. Well, um, no, it's it's not very hard at all. Um, I, I I'm I'm very lucky that I get paid to write takes and like to be a take worker we're not paying you for this just so you know there's no money being exchanged yeah no i know um i i had already written up a kind of an honorarium invoice just (laughs) fyi but uh, okay um yeah i mean it's it's really it's really really nice that to 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 do it the way i can do it now especially um kind of running my own publication as you know where you are um independently i worked for a decade at various um various uh plants are within the broad rupert murdoch foundry so i i started out working at the wall street journal um was there for five years then went to the new york post and then i left last year to launch my own thing and yeah i mean i was in law school i had gone to law school intending to practice law uh, but then at some point i started writing articles on the side and i um I enjoyed that much more than the prospect of writing memos for some partner who would never actually read them. And so, yeah, I mean, despite having a lot of law school debt, I went into journalism, which, as you know, there's a there's a buck in that racket. Um, there isn't actually. <laughs> and, I understood um, that. I understood the joke. <laughs> good. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. So that's how I I I, I um, got into it. And so it, it, how it started was initially. I happened to be from Iran. I was born in the capital, Tehran, um, immigrated to the United States when I was about to turn 14. And um, so I started writing about what I knew, which was Iran. And so that's kind of how I got my foot through the door. But my intent was never to become like an Iran guy, one of those people who professionally write about Iran from abroad. Um, That was just my entree to the business. And so um, luckily, I was able to just expand and become a kind of generalist opinion maker cool what was the environment like working at the wall street journal and the new york post a lot of good uh water cooler conversations there or did are you were you all remote uh you know they they have very different tone and mood and that that's reflected in the office you know the journal is very um buttoned up and um you have to wear a shirt at the wall street journal oh you definitely yeah definitely definitely and i I, 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 yeah, I, you know, I like that. I mean, I didn't mind that, but um, the t- the tone was because I was like, I started as a book review editor, and um, you know, the the editor who's above me is still there, one of the most talented editors ever, Eric Eichmann, and his his mode was very sort of like when he would send back something you had edited with additional touches, he would just be like, well, it's 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 not a crime, but you know, there's a dangling <laughs> modifier here, and if you could just you know, I'd suggest changing it. Whereas at the post, which is a tabloid, the atmosphere is very yelly and it's just, it's much different. Like it's, you know, there are, there are like, give me pictures of Spider-Man. Yeah. Well, that's, 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 yeah. I mean, I was on the opinion page. So I was never doing, but it was oh, okay. just, just sort of like, what the hell is this? What have you written? It sucks. Do it again. You know, it, it was not so genteel. You know? I feel like you should <laughs> work to that, make the and environment here more yelly. I need, we need more yelly. We need more yelling here. here. Like there's blasphemy in this article. Blasphemy. <laughs> Edit it. Yeah. <laughs> what was the worst book that you reviewed while you were a book reviewer? Do you remember? Is there one that stands out? 
Oh, I, I reviewed a book very harshly. I, I would have to remember the name, but it was um, by a, a BBC correspondent um, where it, it was her account of um, Hillary Clinton's tenure as Secretary of State. Mm-hmm. And it was just, you know, it's just sort of this adulatory, laudatory take on Clinton facing down the world's challenges. Um, I think and that's the it, only it, way you're allowed to write about Hillary Clinton. It's it's true. Just, <laughs> she's just the best. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, it, and it was sort of like it, full of these little details that that were almost designed to be obnoxious. Where it was like, then we went back into her airplane and we were served soft, gooey chocolate <laughs> cookies. And it was just sort of like... Who, you know, meanwhile, like Benghazi had had happened, and and, and it's sort of the disaster of of the uh, the Libyan intervention, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but it was like the chocolate cookies. At least the, the cookies were good. That's <laughs> the terrorist attack. <laughs> and, and young women in you know in Indonesia just looked up to her so much. Oh, just this, and, and it was a sort of girl boss genre before that was a oh. thing. So that that was probably the worst book I ever read. So you were triggered by that book. I was triggered. Yeah, All right. sad. Yeah. So and I, I gave it a good, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you've uh, you've now gone and launched Compact Magazine, which is in all caps. So I assume I have to yell it every time I see it. Compact Magazine. Yep. And yep. Uh, I, I'm always interested when people have a nice job at you know in in, in a field, and then they decide to go launch their own thing because I, I feel like there's like two types of people and very few people are the type of person that goes no i'm gonna go start my own thing like i i started writing at the babylon b on day one but i wasn't the guy who had the initiative to be like let's launch this let's write let's make christian news satire <laughs> like that's gonna be a thing <laughs> yeah same here i always grab someone else's coattail that's what i was I, like ah, that guy's got an exactly idea what, I'll, I'll go follow him that's exactly what i did so i'm just interested like what caused yeah. you to have that entrepreneurial spirit yeah, I, um, I am. I have always been an employee, you know, ever since I just got a paycheck and and you show up and yeah, as so I, I was always an opinion editor and as an opinion editor, okay, sometimes you publish something and it, it blows up online, everyone's talking about it, and you're very pleased. Sometimes, you know, the piece has sort of influence in a narrow policy community. And even though it's not widely read, you're pleased with that. Or sometimes things are a dud and that's it. And it, nevertheless, you go home and, and you get your paycheck and, mm-hmm. and these jobs are very, they're sort of semi-permanent. The, it, it's almost like getting kind of university tenure. Um, so why take the risk? I, basically, uh, you know, my my partner and I, Matthew Schmitz, has started talking about this as early as 2020 in the kind of the, uh, the height of the pandemic where... Um, you know, we we are we are both men of the right, but we think we we felt that there's this um, this unaddressed gap in in conservative journalism, which is that um, a lot of uh, a lot of voters uh, who, who pulled the pull 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 for the GOP or for for uh, especially GOP under President Trump um, are actually quite populist, and they're not. Um, uh, they're not easily persuaded by the old kind of Reaganite free market, low tax orthodoxy. In many ways, they want to preserve aspects of the New Deal um, or, uh, and protect it rather than to try to smash it down, which had become kind of the GOP. And so we we wanted to explore that zone seriously and to publish writers um, who would who would talk about that forthrightly. And that's what we did. I mean, the idea of compact, the names um, evokes an alliance. And um, the, the the alliance in the name is people like me and Matthew who are who are um, political conservatives but populist inclined, and populist writers, including left populists. And this, I have to make an important distinction: left populists are not like you know um, Ibram Kendi or the New York Times editorial page. These are people who um, you know they're about workers' rights and about um, corporate power, about um, Silicon Valley's overweening kind of role in our life. So, um, th- and that's the idea. We just felt like these conversations were happening on Twitter. You saw someone like Glenn Greenwald, who is on our editorial board, um, forging alliances with right wingers because they now say, "Oh yeah, Glenn was right. The sort of war on terror created this vast national security apparatus that's maybe not so good." Um, so it was happening organically, and we wanted to institutionalize it in terms of. You know, and then the kind of entrepreneurial aspect, I still, I still have, I'm sort of 
marvel at the fact that we managed to sort of raise money for this thing and get I've, you know, to do payroll and pay taxes. And yeah, again, we're we're like. not paying you. Just, <laughs> well, I just want to make that clear. I understand. I understand. Okay. But I'm saying, right. and okay. it, it, for me, it's it was it's just very new and cool and interesting, and we'll, we'll see how we do with it. We're very pleased with it so far. Um, cool. But that's the genesis. In finding writers for this magazine, do you ever find that you find more common ground with the sort of populist people on the left rather than the sort of traditional? Reagan GOP kind of people? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, look, I mean, there are there are cultural issues where um there are there isn't agreement, right? There's not common ground. Uh and we're, you know, Matthew and I are both Roman Catholics, and we are Orthodox, small or orthodox in the sense that we, you know, um are serious about the church's teaching on all the things that make cultural liberals and leftists uncomfortable sexuality abortion etc cetera, etc cetera. um but you know uh we're also we're on, on prudential questions things that that the church leaves up for individual men and women to decide given a particular context like the economy there's no um there's no rule that says christians should be you know uh avid free marketeers you know free markets as we know them as sort of the ideology of free markets emerged two three hundred years ago um so it's a, it's a modern invention and so there's no commitment there and if you're having kind of open-minded you can um uh, you, you i do find i do frankly find common ground with them because there are certain things about you know if you read economic history and you're like well why why did we why did we have a new deal for example or why did new labor unions become an important part of um of the american economy uh, in response to industrialization, the vast power gaps between the individual worker going up against um, a large employer, that those were real problems that had to be addressed. And so you, I, the, the dogmatism of some on the right now get on my <laughs> gets on my <laughs> about these things, which are not, you know, they're not of the essence of what it means to be a Christian or an American, I think. Okay. Now, will Compact Magazine have a swimsuit edition, and will you put a fat lady on there to promote body positivity? We, we are painfully serious for the most part. If you <laughs> if you visit our um, the tone, it just that that would not um, that would not fly. So no, I mean <laughs> at least not now. Maybe a few years down. Yeah, the occasionally, line. okay. Look, I, I I used to work at part of my career. I used to work at a tabloid, and there are certain pieces where I'm like. My New York Post instinct to put something salacious, uh, at, at least for the picture, and then would be like, no, but that's not that's not us. That's not compact. <laughs> yeah, like the Hunter Biden laptop story. That was that was too far in your opinion for the Post. Well, as as a piece of journalism, it was no, 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 no. That that was normal. Uh, that, that's a great achievement for the Post. But uh, you know, like, yeah, I mean, the Post occasionally just has a picture of a babe on the cover. Right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, we're not going to do that. Or three that's of them cool. with Hunter Biden. Maybe. <laughs> well, one of the things I find hard, I don't know if this overlaps or not, but it brought it to mind, like at the Babylon Bee or when I'm doing stand up, it's like I try to kind of work kind of clean and from a Christian perspective. But a lot of the yeah. stories that are out there when it's like Hunter Biden doing crack with prostitutes or when it's transgender people going yeah. into locker rooms with, you know, like little girl, there's like a salacious aspect to everything that's going on. And it's like if you want to talk about these stories, you have to kind of decide how far down that road you're going to go. I'm surprised that this is you trying to be clean. All See, you're I've told you this before. When I go out <laughs> to regular comedy clubs, people will come up to me and go, I can't believe how clean you are. <laughs> then when I come to Babylon Bee or conservative outlets, they're like, oh, that's so dirty. That's, I can't <laughs> believe you said that. <laughs> yes. So anyway, oh, yeah. so Rab is here. Um, so <laughs> you, <laughs> so in Compact, um, you call it your home for journalism that challenges the ruling class. So, uh, who the heck is the ruling class? What the heck are you talking about? Well, I mean, we definitely do have a ruling class. Um, uh, every society has a ruling class. Um, um, but uh, ours happens to be, I mean, um, you know, the owners of owners of capital, frankly, very large owners of capital. And then there's a kind of layer of professional managerial kind of classes that services the assets of those others. And then there is everyone else. There is, um, you know, kind of like downwardly mobile professionals in the cities. There is 
uh, wage workers, et cetera. So, I mean, we have a kind of material analysis of this. Um, and then beyond that, I mean, um, our ruling class is very much implicated in, um, in, in Hollywood, Wall Street, um, in academe, uh, in, and of course in, um, media as well. Um, and over the past two, three, four years, I would say, um, it's become self-aware in a way that maybe it wasn't before. In other words, um, in response to a populist wave that swept the United States and, um, and Europe as well, uh, you know, Brexit, the Trump movement, et cetera, um, our elites maybe realize that they share more with each other than any of them do with kind of the populist constituency. And they've reacted very badly, I would say. I mean, in other words, instead of saying, so why are people embracing Trump? Um, what does this say about the state of our society? What's ha what has what globalization done to working class lives, et cetera, et cetera? The response has been, they are bigots, they're a threat to democracy and they have to be sort of suppressed and their speech has to be regulated online, et cetera, et cetera. And so we, um, that's that kind of nexus of, of capital media capacity, technological uh, uh, power that forms our ruling class, we seek to sort of expose it. And, um, and then a new one, we criticize, I would say, the, both the mainstream right and the mainstream left, because we think both of them ultimately um, serve this ruling class. The mainstream left, although it talks a lot about uh, equity and justice, all this sort of talk about um, uh, race, gender, et cetera, has been easily accommodated by, by corporate America. In other words, if it really threatened the interests of um, Apple Corporation, Nike, uh, the trustees of Ivy League universities, Brooks Brothers, et cetera, they would not be at the forefront of kind of race, gender, sex ideology. If anything, this divides Americans and makes it harder for them to build solidarity across their differences. And of course, the mainstream right too often um, is frankly just the party of plutocracy and um, low taxes, globalization, et cetera, at the expense of, of ordinary Americans. So um, you know, the, the New York Times published an op-ed or, or a, a kind of feature story about us on the day of our launch. And the headline was taking on the left and the right too. And I think that's pretty accurate about us. Okay. Yeah, we only make fun of the left, so we can't really relate <laughs> to you there. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there are things to make fun of about the right. But, <laughs> but you know, in part because it's cult the right is culturally powerless. It really is. You feel bad making fun of it. And I, I sometimes do on Twitter and I'm like, you're punching down. <laughs> well, I found, I, I like making fun of the right. It's just that sometimes because, because there's so many like late night comics and that's their whole shtick, like it gets yeah. boring just telling the same like, oh, rednecks, you know, yeah. you're like, well, they've already told that joke. You we know. come up with good jokes about it, I feel like, and some of it's self-deprecating, but then it feels like you're piling on yeah, versus, what everyone else is already yeah. doing, kind of. When I say making fun of the right, I don't mean the the ordinary Trump voter, but I think, for example, Lindsey Graham is a like a... Oh, yeah. Well, what would you make fun of him about? about? What could you possibly make fun of him about? <laughs> yeah, I mean... Good sir. His His... What was it? He tweeted like two, three days into the Russian invasion of Ukraine. He was like, who, who is it that's going to go assassinate oh, Putin? I'm like... This is that's insane. Yeah. Don't say this. Like, why? Why do you want like, this kind of escalation? So that's what I go after yeah. him for. Now you bring not up as fame, not his infamous private life. Eh. <laughs> uh, now you brought up class a few times. Now socialists talk a lot about class uh, conflicts. Yeah. You're not a socialist, are you? Or do you find common ground with socialists at all? No, I, I'm not. I'm not a socialist in this. I don't. I don't. Um, I don't think it's feasible um, or desirable to do away with private property, um, but I do think you don't you don't have to be a socialist to recognize um, class as a material reality that has it's kind of definitive role in how our economy is organized. In other words, there's um, you you could go to you can go to um, President Jackson to hear him talk about class. You can go to um, Theodore Roosevelt to hear him talk about class distinctions in American society. Um, if I have to say, look, in the, in the 19th century, despite its obviously sort of Gilded Age opulence and its kind of class tensions, our politicians were much more comfortable talking about, um, you know, they would talk about the money power, 
versus the ordinary person, etc. So, um, you know, it's a reality that uh, uh, certainly sort of Marxist economic theory recognizes, but plenty of non-Marxist economic theory recognizes as well that, you know, with the rise of industrialization, you had this um, class of people who emerged who could only subsist and reproduce themselves by selling their labor power on the market compared to older forms where, you know, there were still hierarchies and so forth, but, um, you know, in, in feudal society, the sort of the, um, the nobleman was kind of somehow responsible also for his, um, um, uh, his serfs. And obviously that is a relationship of exploitation too, but it was different. There's something happened with the rise of um, industrialization and rise of modern capitalism where, um, you know, millions of people could uh, could no longer subsist, but by selling their uh, labor on uh, on the market, and with the, that was a position of profound insecurity for a lot of them because um, you know they're um, as individuals, right? It's much harder to negotiate, for example, over your your wages, etc., versus a large entity, and that um, that wasn't the case when a lot of free market theory was formulated. It was it was formulated in the late 18th century before the rise of uh, industrialism on a vast scale so that they had this sort of ideal models of what, what markets um, operate like, where there's, you know, multiple producers in any given industry and they compete enough that it means that uh, 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 not one of them can control the wages that are paid, et cetera, et cetera. That was not industrial reality. And so... Um, there had to be a correction um, of how we think about the economy, and and that was to recognize kind of this this these issues that I laid forward, and um, uh, uh, and there was to to a great extent, right? I mean, I, I you know I, I'm going to make myself maybe unpopular among your audience or here, but I think like the New Deal uh, and the experiment of social democracy on the other side of the Atlantic as well was it was an achievement. The idea that you know um, if you grant a minimum of a, of a welfare net. Uh, it it increases workers' uh, bargaining power because they're not like facing starvation or take you know any job at any wage, um, and those achievements were lost beginning in the 1970s, uh, where there was a kind of massive pushback against against social democracy, and that persists to this day. And it's brought us to a point as is inappropriate for a Babylon B compact uh, uh, discussion, maybe, but it's brought us to a point where all of us feel that corporate power is too too strong, right? I mean, uh, big tech um, censorship is the most visible example of this. And so I, you know, we were comfortable talking about that. And, we, you know, you don't, um, you don't have to go all the way towards sort of nationalizing every, uh, every industry to recognize these realities. That makes sense. I think only a few of our commenters will call you a socialist yeah. after that. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> but no, tech censorship is a big issue. Have you had to deal with the big tech censorship at all? I know you were involved with the Hunter Biden laptop story. Have you encountered any more of that on Twitter? Have I? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, no, I mean, not, uh, not personally. I, uh -huh. For some reason, I never get censored. Not on um, your personal account. You haven't had. Not on my personal account. Issues but of course, I, I was working at the New York Post when we broke the Hunter Biden uh, laptop story. And um, uh, I mean, I remember the day like it was yesterday. It was um, October 14th, five in the morning. I always wake up to see what we have on our front page. Um, sometimes I look the night before, but in this case I hadn't. And I was, I saw the story. I was like, whoa, that's big. This is huge. And then uh, four or five hours went by and I saw this Facebook spokesman named Andy Stone post something yeah, like- Yeah, I remember that, yeah. We've yeah. seen this despicable New York Post story. Um, we will. Uh, yeah, we're monitoring the situation, and <laughs> we're monitoring the situation. And pending, pending fact checking, we're reducing circulation of it on our platform. I was like, okay, well, there there have been lots of anti-Trump stories the past four years that were, you know, not completely false. To yeah, of, and then they all, <laughs> they, they, they would, yeah, and they would, would still me. promote them. So that okay, and then an hour later, people started telling me I can't post it on Twitter, and then more alarmingly people reached out to me and said, can you send me this story? I need to find it. And I would send it to them, but Twitter would block you from sending it in direct messages. That's wild. Either. And it, and it got blocked or sort of throttled on Facebook also, right? That it, story? They got, they well, reduced that was, circulation. Yeah, that was the Andy circulation. Stone guy. We oh, reduced, okay. Yeah, we have reduced its circulation on our platform or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that was a, that, it, it was a, it was a, a kind of, 
a really wild 24 hours. And personally, I, I was not involved in the reporting of that. Like I said, I'm on the opinion side and New York Post, like many other newspapers, has a, a Chinese wall between the um, opinion and news section. But I sort of started going on. A wall? wall? Is that a racist term? Yeah, Chinese that sounded wall? racist to me. Is it? I, I don't know. I what just, does it mean? I've never I, heard I, of it. I've heard of firewall and I've heard I, well, of no, I meant, wall. What's yeah, a I mean, Chinese yeah, wall? I, it, it was an achievement. They kept It kept out the Mongolians. Why would it be racist? Oh, like the wall of China, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pink I Floyd's think that's probably... Wall. What's, so what is the Chinese... Is that like an actual wall? Is that an expression? I've never heard that before. Yeah, he it, was saying it's like the Great Wall of China, like dividing those two. It's been dividing it opinion keeps and them out. But is there an actual just, wall? I want to know if there's an actual wall. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, there is not a physical wall in, in the building between news and opinion. I just meant that you don't, you don't interact okay. with your okay. news Thank side you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, they suspended us for for, for 14 days. Um, now, keep in mind, the New York Post is America's oldest continuously published daily paper. It was founded by Alexander Hamilton. Um, and so the, the idea that um, a few tech oligarchs could uh, disappear this story, which turned out to be 100% correct. Yeah, that's not the one, wild part to me. A 100% true story. <laughs> like the New York Times then, and, and, and this is the most infuriating part of it. The New York Post, for example, ran a piece about it saying, da da da, insubstantiate this and that. And, you know, we called them out on it. We were like, what what was insubstantiated about it? And they they ninja corrected insubstantiated. Who out was of that? The Did you say the Washington Post? The New York Times, sorry. New York Times. I thought you said Times, New York Post. Yeah. Okay, yeah, New York Times. Well, no, it was, they, they had written about a, I mean, it was a complex case involving whether it was a violation of Federal Communications Commission rules for that censorship to happen. As it, as it happened, the FCC ruled that it was not a violation of FCC rules. But in writing about it, the New York Times said the, the New York Post's um, unsubstantiated story. And this was months later when you know, after, despite like enormous efforts to discredit the story, nothing had been discredited about it. So we were like, what's insubst what's unsubstantiated about it? And they, um, they deleted that word from their story without ever running a correction saying why, you know, usually if you um, change, alter a story in that sort of substantive way, you have to account yeah. for why you changed it with a correction or clarification. They sort of just ninja edited that word out of the story without explanation. Anyway, and then like six months after that, the New York Times ran a story being like, yeah, it was all, it was all correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, who are your top five favorite saints to pray to? Um, well, I mean, uh, I, because I know you guys are Catholics. I just want to be clear. We don't, we don't pray to the saints. We I ask asked the question. question. <laughs> Answer the question, sir. Yeah, to, 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 to intercede for us. But I, I, I'm very fond of St. Maximilian Kolbe. Um, I've Saint never Thomas. heard of that one. Great choice. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. I'll tell you the St. Maximilian Kolbe story uh -huh. in a second. Um, you know, obviously the classic St. Thomas Aquinas. Classic, yeah. Um, St. Augustine, it, when I was received into the church, I took the- Those two I've read before. I'm a, yeah. Augustine. Um, Can you see this? This is our Augustine statue. Oh, wonderful. We don't pray wonderful. to him, but- Yeah. We just uh, have an idol of him. We just have an <laughs> idol. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, as, you know, some of the modern popes, St. John Paul II. Um, How's he doing? St. Pius X. They still talk, they still talk to him. <laughs> He's in heaven. He's doing great. Yeah. Um, that's what canonization means. Um, no, but St. Maximilian Kolbe, my son is named after him. Oh. Um, he was a Franciscan friar who um, was Polish Franciscan friar, was arrested by the Nazis in 1941 so during the German occupation of Poland and was taken to the Auschwitz concentration camp and uh, someone escaped from his prison block and the commandant had this rule where if someone escaped, he would pick 10 men to die of starvation as a sort of collective punishment for the one escapee. And St. Maximilian was not picked among the 10 to die of starvation, but he heard another man who was among the condemned. He sort of cried out like, my wife, my children, I have a family. So he stepped forward from the line and said, I'll, I'll die in his place. And so he was, a, um, that, that's how he was, he was a uh, martyr. So he's a martyr of charity. He was canonized by John Paul II in uh, 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 
who's beatified in the 1970s and canonized in the 1980s. So awesome. And hence why my son is Max. Oh, cool. And is he now like a patron saint for a certain thing? Or yes. Oh, okay. He's the patron saint of, of, uh, journalists and drug addicts, among others. Oh, okay. I don't so know that's why drug addicts. Overlap for the Hunter Biden story, both sides of it. <laughs> the journalist writing about I'm it sure and Saint Hunter Max Biden Lane, himself. I'm sure St. Maximilian is praying for Hunter. He's interceding we, for both of them. For yes. <laughs> Coming up next for Babylon B subscribers. Um, drag queen story hours. A blessing of liberty or not? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I never thought drag queens would be something that like would be associated with my name. In your bio, when you grew up in Iran, there was something where you said you got interrogated because you had a copy of Star Wars on videotape and it was banned at the time. I want to ask you about that. And then do you think we should ban the trilogy sequel in this country just because it's awful? This has been another edition of the B Weekly from the dedicated team of certified fake news journalists you can trust here at the Babylon B, reminding you that someone out there knows something about Carmen, and we're going to find them.